My name is Chris Kahn. I'm the Director of UAS and Geospatial Services at American Water. And we'll talk a little bit about our data collection programs. So first we do have the obligatory about the company slides. American Water is the largest water and wastewater utility owned provider in the country. And as such, we actually have quite a large footprint in a number of states. A key thing to note on this slide is uh, our size. So the 50,000 plus miles of pipeline we have, and that equates to just over 5 million assets that rise to the surface. So assets like meter pits and curb stops, all of which have to be mapped and GPS by our uh, collective GIS teams. <clears throat> so we'll be talking today about a few specific geospatial data capture technologies. I'm going to cover, blocking the screen here, so let me move this. I'm going to cover the um, GNSS Legacy Project. So that's a project in New Jersey where we uh, spanned 10,000 miles of Maine and captured about a million assets with uh, sub-inch accuracy. Next thing, I'm going to talk about ground-penetrating radar. This is how the GIS team is able to map buried assets in between assets that rise to the surface, where we can't see something to GPS with the same accuracy as, as uh, GNSS. I'll join in again to talk about our UAS program structure, and that's how we extend our ability to map sub-centimeters of inch on everything we do. So before I go into our legacy GNSS project, I really wanted to share this quote. It was 2012, and we had just completed our deployment of offline mobile GIS to 500 of our frontline workers. And one of the greatest and most challenging things about GIS is as soon as you do something terrific, people ask for more. But this director did have a really good point. And this is sort of how we imagine ourselves delivering upon his request. We knew intuitively that there were millions of dollars in operational costs related to not having our accurate locations on all of our buried assets. We also knew there were just a few things that we needed to do before this glorious moment could materialize. We had a vague idea that at a minimum, we would need to expand our department headcount pretty dramatically and purchase at least hundreds of thousands of dollars in equipment. And even with those things, we thought it was probably more than a 10 year project. We had zero budget. Uh, in fact, up to that point, the only business case we had done was, that, was to purchase a $7,000 plot. Successful, I might add. Undeterred, we developed a business case um, of course, started with the cost summaries. So th these are the costs of doing the project if we were to do it. And the key thing to notice here is our desired field data collection pace. It's probably very hard to read, but it's a third of a mile an hour. And that might not seem like much, especially with a million assets, um, but it's actually pretty quick. This table allowed us to adjust the data collection and the GIS editing piece, the desired project length, uh, accounted for time off and all that stuff. And that was all based on our observations from testing and our desired outcomes. And next, of course, we had to go into the benefits. And this is just a small snippet of the tables we developed. We got really nerdy with this. Um, the benefits of the project are actually the costs too, right? The benefits are actually the cost of doing nothing. Um, these tables were actually very conservative. We wanted to be careful, so they're an underestimation. And they were all grounded in observable facts. So we did crew ride-alongs. We counted up how many work orders actually required a, a, a visit to a physical asset. The projected benefits of doing the project were over $2.5 million a year in reduction in operational expense, annual. Uh, so for those in the room who are in utilities, which I assume is most of you, uh, you know that OPEX expense is unrecoverable cost, and anything to reduce OPEX, uh, we love. So two and a half million dollars a year because our field staff collectively were spending over 55,000 hours a year just looking for stuff. Finally, we had to figure out how quickly were we to do the data collection that our GIS staff could manage all of that incoming G GPS data uh, and update our actual distribution map to reflect the changes. We created uh, similar projections for the field work. So hardware. Um, again, we had over a million assets spread across 10,000 linear miles of pipe, and the hardware we had available to us at the time were these. 
So to scale, we knew we were going to need a paradigm shift. And after a few months of searching and a whole lot of tinkering, we managed to somewhat hack Esri's water utility mobile map for Windows. Now this was before ArcGIS Online, and it would actually be years before ArcGIS Collector could even consume RTK data. So we configured this Windows mobile map to update our default SDE version with real-time RTK data. And the first couple of units we used along with this setup were SX Blue, but we almost immediately changed to EOS Arrow Goals. And this was primarily because EOS had the vision to develop for iOS back then, which even at that time we knew was where we wanted to take this. <clears throat> and then once Esri enabled Collector to capture RTK data, we immediately switched over from the Windows to the iPads. And then finally today, of course, we're using RTS field maps along with those EOS goals. In fact, we now have over 300 arrow golds deployed across the state in New Jersey and, and nearly 1,000 deployed across the American water. We've also built 14 EOS arrow gold base stations. So these are in regions where we have service territory without free RTK services. Um, one base station is right there. It's on the roof of a college near, in our territory. Uh, that one took about an hour, maybe 45 minutes to install. So quite easy to do. <clears throat> Um, these base stations also provide corrections for all four constellations. For those of you that do RTK, you know that a lot of the RTK services that are free only do GLONASS and GPS. Ours includes by, uh, Beidou and Galileo as well. <coughs> Excuse me. We also use the EOS, uh, ArcGIS field maps, and uh, LaserTech TruePulse laser integration. So that's a GUI integration within ArcGIS field maps. Um, and we use that for busy intersections. So we have a little uh, screenshot, and you can see the valve circled in the intersection. In order to do that intersection, we would need a lane closure and or police assistance, which of course we have to pay for. Implementing this workflow alone saved about $1,000 an hour. And capturing those three valves instead of a couple hours in traffic control takes one person about one minute. The speed that we were actually collecting data at was remarkable. It was not unusual for a single GPS uh, technician to clock over a thousand points in a day. In fact, we were collecting GNS data so fast, it was 98% less expensive and 98 and something changed faster than our engineering contractors were providing as built GPS data for us. So we immediately fired them. <laughs> Early on, we relied very heavily on Excel, which you saw before for reporting. Um, but in 2014, we were an early adopter of dashboards, and this is our first dashboard that we started using to track this legacy project. And then over the years, we continually updated tracking and dashboards as it evolved as a product, and eventually allowed us to capture all of the detail that we needed right in the dashboard. I do want to pause to point out that 30,000 number under the cannot locates. This is interesting. These are assets that a GPS text could not find on the first pass. It was really helpful to quantify because these all became work orders to find them and dig them up, often by trenching. And this was a somewhat silent OPEX expense for us. They were spread out across the state. Um, they caused headaches, but only randomly. And then this project was able to quantify, find them, quantify how much they were uh, costing us, and then fix them. And that quantification ended up being an extra 1.5 million in reduction OPEX for the project. So we actually had a clear, uh, a really good laser-guided shovel that that director wanted really early on in the project in 2014. And before I hand it off to Nick, I really couldn't resist showing an overly dramatic and very dated video that I put together in 2014 that I do remember being quite proud of. <coughs> Laser guided shovel is pictured. It's pictured bottom right there, so it's a little bit more sophisticated now. Um, frontline staff can now use their BYOD device 
paired with a lightweight GNSS clip, which is helpful in the scenes like the top right where the valve is completely flooded. Um, also if the valve is buried or, or plenty of other situations like snow. And the 2022 video clip I'm gonna play right here, let's move out of the way, is actually from our American Water Learning Management System. So this is training for frontline staff and it's actually on the proper use of offline maps, but it does have a nice little split screen explanation of how to use the ArcGIS Field Maps Compass tool. Our frontline staff will use the directions tool in ArcGIS Field Maps to get turn by turn directions to an asset. And then once out of the truck on foot, they will then use the compass tool as their laser guided shovel. Your location is indicated by the blue icon. In this example, you can see that we're walking towards a water mouth. I really like how ArcGIS Field Maps has that dashed red line that even looks like a laser beam. And there's our valve. Uh, I also head up the UAS program nationally at American Water. Um, I'm a private pilot with a single engine land rating, um, and I do find that that experience helps me a lot in this role, which really places a heavy emphasis on instilling an aviation culture into our UAS operations. Start out with some key program stats. Um, a key stat to look at right off the bat is that volume of imagery that we're capturing. And we're just getting started. That 450,000 was captured by about five pilots of our 50 plus pilots. Uh, a huge part of the program is figuring out how to efficiently take all that data and deliver it to end users. Another big part of the program is the training. We run our program as if it's part 135 not part 107. And part 135 is the air carrier and operation portion of the federal code. Whereas part 107, just the UAS portion. And part 107 doesn't contain any information about how to effectively run an aviation department. Um, next, to save a little time, I'm just gonna play a three minute video I put together. It's a high level overview of our UAS program. The bottom line is always safety, and, and we have our, our safety of our employees and, and our customers in mind. Um, we're not uh, doing this to be the on the leading edge of the technology just for the technology's sake. It really does pay kind of immediate dividends, and we've known that for quite some time. So it's scaling now. We've been doing a lot of work over the past several years to ready the company to move more quickly, but to move more quickly, you have to have established policies and procedures. And now with the growing awareness, we'll be able to scale without um, really needing to push or ask. People will ask us.
All right, so who could tell me what was happening with the back props at the end of that video? And I thought we'd have one pilot in the audience. Steering. Stall prevention. So it's automatic stall prevention on the drone. That pilot uh, banked up too high and was going to crash it. Uh, safety first. All right, so I hope the video is helpful in providing a high-level uh, overview of the program. Um, most of our drone operations occur in these middle four icons here, so these will all be visual line of sight, visual line of sight ops with a high number of flights. And because so many of these are near obstacles, uh, our flight standards and our flight training are actually pretty important. <coughs> Down at the bottom, DV loss, real-time emergency uh, uh, data streams, those are our more complex ops. Uh, so these have a much longer and much larger return on investment. They take a little bit of a longer leash for, for my team to accomplish. Um, I'm very excited to announce that last Friday, July 9th, the FAA approved American Water with a beyond line of sight waiver for missions along that river that you saw flooded a few minutes ago. Uh, the FAA has only approved 220 of these, uh, and they've only approved 1% of applications. So that does mean about 17,000 people have been denied applications. So we're really excited and proud to have gotten that approval. Um, beyond line of sight is uh, pretty important for the company around our goals of source water protection, water quality, and asset hardening for uh, in emergencies, so our resiliency. Um, to realize the program goals, we actually need to fly higher. We're testing later this year. We're going for approval to fly at 3,200 feet with the drone, and then we're eventually trying to go 10, 20, 30 miles out. So baby steps, crawl, walk, run. I like to say roll over, crawl, walk, run, and we're on the rollover stage now but uh, a big, big step with that approval. So I'd like to take another look, a closer look at that video from the montage. Um, that flooding was in the remnants of Hurricane Ida. We have a flood wall around that plant. It happens fairly often. Um, flooding like this is a very common environmental threat to the company. But we're going to begin to add some of the power of geospatial intelligence in by utilizing ArcGIS Pro's FMV capabilities. So full motion video in the ArcGIS Image Analyst extension provides capabilities for playing as well as analysis of video data that is FMV compliant from drones. So this geospatial ena geospatially enables our video data, providing end users who might not be like very spatially aware, so C-suite uh, leadership, to begin to understand where the video feed is in relationship to a map and see that side by side. But it doesn't stop there. Playing, it is playing. Uh, we can now do simple map tasks like taking measurements directly in the video view, and of course we can display our enterprise GIS data right in the video view. We can take a video still from the drone and instantly display that geospatially within our map. The most powerful, powerful functionality is that FMV allows you to edit feature data either in the video view or the map view to provide analysis capability. So let's say I wanted to identify features in my GIS from the video feed. I can telestrate directly in the video feed as I just did. And then since this is now GIS data, I'm then going to use that to select my hydrants and valves that intersect with that shape that I just created. Now this is only a teeny peek into how we're beginning to value and engineer UAS data streams. For example, we also have a drone that can physically take water samples anywhere we need to in the water, in rivers. <clears throat> so UAS technology at American Water is on a similar trajectory as GNSS was, GNSS was about 10 years ago. And we're super aware of that. So today we have the benefits of many lessons learned through that GNSS project, and we're able to anticipate, organize, and plan for explosive growth that we're now experiencing with the technology of the company. And in the next slide, I'll explain a little about how we organized to do that. We started with the foundation of how we would address UAS goals at the company. I mean, these are our values, which really just boil down to safety. And a big part of ensuring safety is having good governance. So the structure, transparency, and account accountability of proper aviation governance strengthens the program in really countless ways. Next, we had added our goals, which goals are just things to measure, right? 
Uh, notice all of the goals, they're kind of hard to read, but they're safety, 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 data. One thing about data, and it just says actionable data, that's it. We add to that the strategic initiatives. So these are all the projects that are gonna accomplish those goals. And then finally, we add tactics, last. These are the how and what that allow us to execute on our projects or our initiatives. I've actually highlighted a couple. So RTS Image Server and RTS Site Scan are tactics that achieve strategic initiatives of serving mapping imagery, processing photogrammetry, and standardizing on visual line of sight flight controls. So those in turn accomplish strategic initiatives, uh, excuse me, goals and outcomes of actionable UAS data and flight safety standards. Likewise, that RTS Pro Mission for FMV I showed a moment ago, that's another tactic that relates to physical and environmental securities initiative. So if you're thinking about starting a UAS program or if you already have, the advice I'll give you is to try, try to not let the dog, uh, the tail wag the dog, right? So start with your values, goals, and strategies, and then use those to inform your decisions on tactics. All too often, it happens the other way around. We start with tactics and software and try to make our goals from that. Try to flip the script there. Um, we believe that our perfect map can be everywhere. And I think you saw that, right? It's over us, it's under us, indoors or outdoors. It doesn't really matter. Our approach with all of these technologies is really holistic and brand agnostic. You know, we pair the best tools with workflows that scale, that can scale within our business. And admittedly, the, uh, the accuracy, precision, and sheer size of these data sets can be really daunting. But we hope that our presenta presentation has sparked a few imaginations in here into believing that your perfect map is not just possible, but also doable. So thank you. You can find myself in about 30 minutes in the Mobile Workforce Special Interest Group meeting, Ballroom 6F. The entire team here, as Seth mentioned earlier, will be in the utilities, telecom, and water booth in the expo hall at 1 p.m.? 1 p.m. 1 p.m. Yep. to answer any questions that we can't answer in the next 10 minutes. With that, I'll turn it back over to Seth. Awesome. Thanks again.